Hello, I'm John Seif. I'm a consultant based in Germany, and well, I think it's been seven years since someone heard me talk about IPv6. Um, this is given that do you remember and what happened? It is a bit of a history talk, but you all just had coffee, so you're good to go. Um, as said, um, who of you doesn't know what an IPv6 address looks like? <laughs> good. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, the first part is in his history of what happened in the IPv6 data in FreeBSD, to some extent at least as I extracted it. Um, there's a bit of, in the middle, configuring IPv6, both client and browser side, a very short note for developers and the outlook for the future. Um, talking about IPv6 these days, I saw that picture lately, and it's a bit like crawling slowly, having a lot to carry along with it, but something good crawling out on the top of it. So I really like the picture. And I'll start with a longer timeline. So in 1999, who was around to remember these days? Well, two. Um, I've been using FreeBSD for half a year at that point. Um, the first commit from Karma happened to FreeBSD, and it was basically the head of files. So that was beginning of November. Two and a half weeks later, you get basic parts, no IPv6 uh, yet, no multicast routing, no upper layer protocols, but you can get automatic express assignment and ping 6 verse. They went on, added UDP, and finally translator thing. The one thing that is interesting on the first commit is it already has third party submissions to their projects in it that they recognize. Um, before Western Christmas, IP, IPsec comes in, and this is something a lot of people these days don't realize that IPsec came along with IPv6, even if we had it by IPv4 as well. And then user space parts come, get up rainfall, and they claim several applications using UDP or raw software's work before the end of the year. So at that time, Karma had been working since 98. They had started merging into the BSDs. Early 2000, TCP comes, and if that, you might realize raw sockets, UDP, TCP, IPP work already. You've got a basically full stack of IPv6 working beginning of 2000. And then multicast routing comes as well. And I picked that one because it's interesting. Firewall, we needed another one. But the thing that is interesting is that Yes, Codebase is coming just before FreeBSD 4.0. And this has been within three months of them starting. So it's been three months, split up in logical chunks, IPv6 and IPv6, was in FreeBSD, and in March 2000, it shipped in FreeBSD 4.0. And that's basically where things started for us. Okay, you'll see a few of those slides and I'll go over them more or less quickly because it's otherwise the boring history lesson. In the next two years, the main things that happened in SysNet INF6 were mergers from Karma snapshots and then the first user request very quickly came to turn all IPv4 MAPV6 addresses. I think the commit message says requested by many. And that's still the default in FreeBSD these days. Also in 2000, quote, fast IPsec, as we called it, came, which then called it from OpenBSD, to my knowledge. Um, I crossed it out at that point, no V6 support yet. The next thing I picked in 2003 is the mention of the Tahi framework in the commit messages. So they did something. 
Christoph was just talking about earlier and will talk in a different context tomorrow in his talk, they've done testing. So they've done, they've added tests to the development and yeah, we are 15 years later and we're building our continuous in integration framework. There's a fun one in 2003 also enable IPv6 for token rings if someone had a need for it. Um, the advanced socket app API came and relating this to me, I blanked it out. Um, that's the first commit I found with my name on it in the v 6 stack. And then there was a really long gap which as I went through my slides surprised me that even nothing has happened or I just blanked it out somehow. Um, the next big thing was a third party contribution through Luigi, which was one of his students did IPv6 support for IPFW and dummy net. So I'll add a quote around and dummy net here because I think that's still not done today. Um, and then we got the first security advisory on IPsec, but that meant people were looking at the code, people were running at the code and noticing things. 2005, same with Karma and then the announcement of the conclusion of the project. So they said, we are done. We have now accomplished our mission. We'll merge the final things, and they did in March. And then it was up to us. And it became more or less, so this was 2006. You'll notice a slide out or two that it became us at one point. Um, People started to harmonize V4 and V6. So it was two stacks developed independently, more or less. And there was overlap and code duplication. So trying to solve these things. The next one I was going out was my own first commit. Then people started to use more and more IPv6 in the wild. You know, it's been on the backbones and everything at that point. Um, and people noticed, oh, we've got this source routing thing in IPv6, which is routing header zero. And if I send a packet out with that, I can just let it loop 20 times between two routers on a link. So if I do this with lots of packets, I can have a nice amplification attack. And that's kind of not good. So routing header zero processing was disabled in 3 and. George Neville Leal, I think, was one of the people who went off and wrote the RFC. Um, I'll quickly jump back. 2002 was fast IPsec. In 2007, so five years later, feature parity happened. It took us five years to actually get the V6 part for fast IPsec done and committed, and then Karma IPsec was removed. And as one of the next big things in the IP layer domain and routing domain was multiple SIPs for IPv4. Again, it was out because no IPv6 support. So 2008 people were still developing IPv4. That's it. Ignore this other thing. Um, the image gets mentioned in 2008 a bit. And shine starts to go away. And people are locking more things. And the first v image commit happens. And the reason I'm telling you v image, <coughs> this is not just v6, is People have used it for testing IPsec, for IPv6 testing. Um, and I guess, Christoph, you have this. I, the image is also on your talk tomorrow. So um, we'll get more security announcements, which means more people, more eyes, more usage. Um, and then uh, multi IPv6 jails and IPv4 jails happened, which brought feature parity after about eight, nine years, I think. And as the first big project, kind of spanning both worlds, V4 and V6, the link layer rewrite, which had to touch both worlds, and splitting routing off of and neighbor discovery, um, had both things in. A year later, after RS0 was disabled, it finally got removed mostly. There still remains left, as I noticed when preparing. We got the big second multicast rewrite in. And then 2009 was BSD can. 
which is where the title comes from if you read the description for the talk, and we'll get to that later. And we had another security advisory. In 2010, we had a GSOC student. Um, she did secure neighbor discovery. So as with other parts, I was in IT before then, people noticed neighbor discovery. Well, people can do all nasty things with it. So they started to address them. Secure neighbor discovery, unfortunately, hasn't ever taken off since. I'm not sure who has the post, but ask by default. Um, but it basically gives three things. One is it has um, public key option in the packet. So you get signature that you can validate. It has cryptographically signed addresses, so you can prove that it is actually this node, it's me talking. And then they use X509 certificates and say, OK, this node can actually be a router from which you can accept things. Um, I think there was a talk at, in, in the paper for HRBSDCon back then. It was implemented as kernel hooks and user space work, which was derived from somewhere else, just to keep the crypto and the certificate handling and everything out of the kernel. Um, the other thing that happened then in 2011 was the IPv6 database company got together and said, OK, let's turn this thing on. And this is where the near-term history of IPv6 more or less more public visibility started. Um, in the lead up to that, I think I picked three things. Um, one was the work on removing IPv4 or disabling IPv4 support in FreeBSD. We had the opposite all the time because people said, I don't want this IPv6 stuff, compile it out, forget it. So did it for IPv4 and then um, the entire name server infrastructure that you can learn automatically from router announcements happened and also all the interface threads at the same time happened so you could control what was happening, what you accepted, a bit more later about this. Um, for the day itself, we had the both IPv6 only, or I would say no IPv4 these days, images and snapshots. We had a couple of web pages I'll show you in a second. An IoT channel, not enough sleep, and Foundation NIX, who sponsored the work, or some of the work for IPv6 only, um, had a press release. But it was a rather uneventful day for FreeBSD. Web pages are still there, I noticed at least some of it. Um, the web server for FreeBSD that was also registered to be cracked looked at normal more or less throughout the day, so you've got a couple of hours leading up to the day and then lead out time some by shifting through. It was business as usual. We had IPv6 support on the web server for quite a while before that already, so um, for me, the, doing the no INET stuff is things people still ask me these days. Why do you do this? Maybe I could have followed the no, no INET 6 version uh, option just to double negate the IPv4 things they've always done. Uh, the other way around, sorry. Not removing IPv6, but removing IPv4. So. Um, I think it was feature parity. It was the interest of looking out into a future that could possibly not have V4 anymore. And I guess I just got hooked at one point on the entire V6 thing 10 years earlier in my private life and wanted to take it further. But also, in order to test the application securely work with IPv6, you needed an environment where you could remove the V4 as well. So go there. I had a funny experience about one and a half years ago. So in 11, I gave a talk here about all the experience I had with doing this. And one and a half years ago, I was in the UK on an IPv6 meeting, and people were saying, all these lower layer stuff, the you know mail servers, all the software basic stuff just worked. We're currently doing WordPress plugins to make sure they work on IPv6 only. And I was thinking, yep, sounds good to me. We sorted the other things, or we started to sort the other things six years ago. Out. So people were continuing this in their own minds as their own needs developed, but not necessarily thinking at that time. I'm not sure how much usage 
see no INET from that world ever saw so far. But as you previously, it's hard to track. And then things went forward very quickly. Um, IPFW forward happened. We had the CPE flag after, I think it was five years if I go back, the multi fit parity from kitchen parity happened. And then we did performance work adding offloading support, which was completely not done in the entire big explode. So TSO, LRO, even checksum offloading to half that wasn't done. Um, and the other thing that we found in that work was we were doing three to four route lookups per IPv6 packet at that time. Um, while the development had happened, there was something called the bug cache. So that wasn't there, and someone removing it years earlier um, had introduced this um, performance penalty. And just doing one early route lookup and passing it down helped performance a lot. I think that part never got into the tree, but it was fixed later, as we'll see. Um, and then people just started to treat it as a normal stack. Locking work, hash tables started coming, the statistics were BDP light. All these things just happened on V4 and V6, or was catching up with on V6, and people weren't ignoring it anymore. Um, IPsec improvements, RSS, lots and lots and lots and lots of code cleanup. Um, um, some features that were missing, like GRE over V6. And then in 2014, we saw the first bits of original transition technology being removed because it was well, not really in use. And I'll, not, I'll spare you going through most of this. The road cache came back, as I said, and the rest is, I think, SAs just code improvement and ongoing work in both stuff until the end so you will see um, IPV, IPFW, network prefix translation for V6. So rather than doing address NAT and port NAT in V6, if you want to do anything, um, you change the prefix of your address and keep everything else the same. That kind of one of the only accepted V6 to V6 net these days, if at all. And then we also got NAT64 on IPFW, stateful and stateless. So that means, stateless means you can have V4 on your outside network, V4 on your inside network, and V6 on your inside network. And then people who still have V4 only but no V6 would connect to that outside V4 address the translator would translate it into a V6 connection internally, so you have V6 only internally. Native V6 just goes through, and with that you can start pushing V6, say, out of your data center. And stateless is, say, for your home network, if you have V6 only inside and you want to connect to a V4 world, so you have DNS 6.4, and then um, it will synthesize your quad A record. You'll try to connect that, but that's just your translator box and that will turn the V6 connection into V4 on the outside world again. Um, who of you are sysadmins? Okay, very few. You will wonder why do I keep telling you about all this locking work, about all these code improvements and stuff. Well, that's kind of like your crashes that you had the base conditions and all the things that people have been seeing over years, the bug reports we got, they got, well, to some, ex some good extent, they got fixed in the last years. Um, there's more than a complete IPsec update. And then in 2017, we started to see the first real edge cases where people say, oh, some of this socket stuff behaves differently. So they were very deep into edge cases that they were testing already. And that, as a feedback, kind of means, OK, we've gotten to that point now. And then something else happened back here, which is unrelated to the stack. But I put it in as a timeline. 
there was a saying, and I got it from Bob Hinton, who was the author, of, one of the authors of the IPv6 RFC, he said, the internet runs on proposed standards because <coughs> RFC 2460 was a proposed standard. And they finally changed that with RFC 8200 into IPv6 as a standard RFC. But whether we are completely compliant to that at the moment is a different story. Um, other things we started seeing is companies doing testing just so we got a lot of pictures in from the University of New Hampshire test framework that one of the downstream consumers of FreeBSD did, which was good, and then ePOC and all other kinds of things just happened over time. We had a couple of reassembly problems again, as in the before world, a, lot of, a few years ago, and then um, CLAP support, flood support came in just a few days ago, and I've not had a look at it yet. So, in summary, that was the history part. It's not, not quite yet 8,650 committed to SysNet IN6. Um, I've ignored most of outside Net IN6. I've ignored most, if not all, of user space. The initial things are, ever, the initial stack, everything came from Karma. FreeBSD people started working on it. It took us a lot of, lot, lot, lot of time to get the feature parity sorted, that people were not ignoring one or the other address family anymore. Um, and these days, it's basically more or less business as usual. So thank goodness developers have accepted both of them are there. And that's basically where we are now. Today, Ottawa, and you might see there's a tiny little curve here in the front of the Calm as the list. Um, the other thing, going back to the first timeline slide, is yes, we are approaching 20 years of IPv6 and previous the end of this year. And that kind of gets me to two things. One was a comment from Paul Hennington earlier this year. You can read it yourself um, for the people at home. Um, he told me I should realize that IPv6 is old enough these days to be a vintage protocol. And well, IPv6 is into the legal age for drinking in the US. Yeah. We always say the training course. Okay, Massimiliano said it's in the legal drinking age in the US now. <laughs> At least in some parts I would assume. So the question is who of you is using IPv4? Hey there, hands down there. Okay, counter question. Who's using IPv6 on a daily basis? That is still a good fraction in the room, good. So who of you has never configured IPv6 on FreeBSD? Yeah, put it up. <laughs> okay, so there are a few people. Um, for me, it's there's a saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. Of, well, the grass is always greener where the karma comes from. Um, saw that in our garden at home by accident. Not been there in a couple of years. So, how do you configure IPv6? That one I've taken straight away from default RC coin as a sample. Static addresses manually assigned, as you would have done at one point in IPv4 land. The first one, we still need the underscore IPv6. You have to give the INF6 keyword an address. There are our, our IPv6 addresses. So if you haven't seen one, there is one. The, the crunchy colon, prefix playing, and 64 in this case. The aliases you intermix with normal IPv4 aliases and put the INF6 keyword in and just sort it out. I never write them like this. So I use prefix notation slash 64. And if you have a static address, you probably want a default router as well. If, as in the IPv4 world, you give a default router. You can have an IPv6 link local address as a default router, which is for the people who are using the previous in data centers where a lot of Linux admins are around and you're gateways outside of your default network and stuff and you want to 
avoid routing trickery and everything. That's the way to go. Um, you can, the IPv6 default interface is given link local addresses as code to an interface, so you can have the same address on multiple interfaces. You can set the default one, and if you don't want to give the scope, it will use that one. In theory, I've never really tested where it is applied. Um, and given out the font, which is, which is it's a shell script, you can just use that in your configuration then as well. Um, if you don't want static configuration, then IPv6 has a nice feature of auto configuration. Um, you say, the easiest way I found is if config interface name IPv6 up, or if you want IPv6 enabled on all interfaces, you just say yes, and that's all you need to do to enable it on a client machine. Um, we will, on interface up, one, one RP solve for you, which is router solicitation. So it tells the routers, please send me a router advertisement so I learn who you are, where you are, what my prefixes can be. It will also help you with DNS information that you learn from there. Um, you can also run IRP Soldi. There are various scenarios where you might want to have that run and call regularly, or if you're changing networks, it can help you if your interface doesn't do media changes and things. But in theory, if you just want to plug the cable in in the morning, you shouldn't need it. You should do all the things you need automatically. Um, IPv6 has a thing called address selection, source address selection in the kernel, and there's a policy associated with it to configure it. Well, these days you shouldn't have to do anything anymore. If you configure any IPv6 address or enable IPv6, um, we will default to IPv6. Now, if you have problematic networks that say we support IPv6 but do not, you might want to manually change it to prefer IPv4 if you're on a dual stack network still. Um, and for the people with very strange requirements, given it's a table, there's a default table built in that we load, and you can change that and load one from a file as well. Um, people are concerned about privacy, and that's the simple flag to turn on. So by default, if you have router advertisement, your local address is generated from your hardware address. And in order to not track you around the world by your hardware address, people have said, OK, we are going to put a random thing there and use that route for connections. So that's the one simple line that you need to enable if you want that. And be aware that people track you by a lot of other things these days. So. Um, the very early on flag that was disabled before mapping before mapping the socket, the idea was in order to facilitate the transition, people would only open the six sockets and do IPv4 connections over them as well. So you put the IPv4 address in a special IPv6 address and the kernel would do the rest. As a kernel developer, I can tell you I hate this feature because it crosses both address families and it's a pain to deal with the edge cases. Um, it's off by default, but there is a, some software out there which requires it on. I think Java at one point was one of them. And I know a car, IMAP server and a mail server that used to use the feature. I don't know how it is these days. So just keep it in mind that if you see something like this, you might have to turn it on. And if you're done with the client side and you want to build your own router, turning forwarding on is as easy as in before you just set IPv6 gateway enable. You can have static routes the same way just with the v6 prefix. It's all the same. And then you'll come across all these flags on an interface. So if you, I have no example at the moment, if you type out config for an IPv6 enabled interface, there's an MD6 line, and it has some of these flags in capital letters. Accept router advertisement 
is one which by default, you know, if you configure auto configuration, it will be on. Um, do not add the router to the default router list. So you receive the announcement, but you don't say, okay, this is going to be a default router. Generate the auto link local address. So sometimes you want to learn your default gateway from RAs, but not have an address on your interface configured automatically because you might only have a static one or whatever. And in this case, you can turn that off. Um, default interface is when there is no default router, use this interface. I have disabled it, the thing that comes out of the history mostly from the people that said, we've got this IPv4 thing, we've got our firewall set up on our laptop, and we go to a conference, and there is V6 enabled, and suddenly we get V6 on our laptop, and we have absolute no protections, and all our sockets are exposed, and people will just hack into my laptop. I think this is how it started. Um, it basically means turn off IPv6 processing and don't do any of this. I brought the V6 only out. It was in my list of all the flags, but I realized later it's not there for you yet. Um, neighbor unreachable detection. Yes, neighbor unreachability detection. Thank you. Um, no prefer iPhase has to do with source address selection again, and know that is do not do duplicate address detection. So in the before world, if you had configured the same address on two different machines, they would kind of fight over packets and both send things, and one of them gets returned and whatever, soon happens to the connection. IPv6 has a building mechanism that says, oh, someone's already using this. I'm not going to enable that address. And it'll mark it that as a duplicate and you can resolve manually. So there's also always a minus version of this to disable the option for if config or on the line, you will just not see it. So with those at hand, you can build a CPE and say on one interface, I will accept from upstream this information on the other interface I don't want to accept anything, I want to just tell other people. And there's a single line, thank you, um, that will do all the things for you, that will change the default kernel syscontrol, it will configure your upstream interface for you with the right options to turn the ones on you need again. And with that, you're sorted, well, almost. You want to do the advertising step on the internal, and you will find at one point there's a bit of clue missing here with, from what you learned to what you announced. But I think we can solve that. And I'll keep it out at the presentation. So, in order to advertise a prefix, you self as a router, maybe DNS information, you turn add the, add the advertise demon on. And it has a nasty classic syntax, which some of us also recognize. <laughs> um, I've given an example. As default flags and RA flags is a couple of flags you can set individually. Uh, um, three of them, uh, two of the bits in the middle are priority bits, so I think number eight means I'm a high priority router. Use me first. And then there's a prefix with a slash six, as a slash six before that will be advertised with two name servers and then the domain for the search list. And your RT sole counterpart that will run automatically, as I said before, or if you run RT Dolby, will take those and put them into RT, uh, into default font for you automatically. So it's basically a counterpart. And if you go and read the main page, you'll find there's a lot of options. A lot of them are implicit there with defaults, and you don't have to deal with lifetimes or any of these things unless you want to. But by default, you shouldn't need to. So now you've got a router. You've got clients to configure. Um, the tooling you'll find is mostly the same as now. Net start, soft start, route. Some of them have dash six. Some have dash add inet six options. 
to fill the jobs IPv6 out. For next step, you might really want to double the application W to get full length addresses for v6 otherwise they get truncated. Um, and the one that is different, what is the out tool in the legacy world, is MVP. And MVP that a shows you all your neighbors, like up slash a did. Um, MVP that R shows you routers that you've learned automatically. And that P shows the prefixes you've learned where you generate the addresses from these things. So you've got the router, you've got the clients, you have the tools at hand, and then you want the firewall. And 3 dsp has three of them. So you can pick and choose. They all support IPv6, one with more features, one with less, depends. Um, I've used three of those four. Yes. <laughs> you, do you remember there used to be IP, F, no, IP6 FW in the very beginning? That last commit that said just before the, you know, I know it's code freeze is coming, FreeBSD4 is coming. That commit, that firewall got removed, thankfully, and merged into IPSW. So at one point, we never had four at the same time because PF wasn't there at that time. So um, whatever you do, even IPv6 is end to end again in theory, no net in between. Whether you want to do the central thing or co host or both, it's up to you. Um, feature parity with IPv4 basically exists on the firewalls. And we provide um, samples for at least IPFW where you can like in the you can choose the client type of firewall and whatever I don't know what they're called anymore. Um, PF has default samples in user shares example or whatever. Um, IPF is the one I've never used so. Um, IPFW has the NAT64 that I mentioned earlier, and that completes the class. I have not used or tested either of that yet. I wanted to switch an old PF snapshot that had a NAT64 that I had before OpenBSD integrated it on FreeBSD. And I've still got it running, and I know it's bugs, but it was all good for me. In all the years, I've not been at home, so. Um, it's transition technologies, and they can help you to remove V4 on your V6 network. Um, or from your transport path, if you have a larger network. Um, a few rules that I, in, to some extent, had a couple of years, and I'm pretty sure some other people who are teaching IPv6 have some other rules. Um, the one thing that for me and Ian should be helped a lot is stop thinking IPv4. Whatever works in the IPv4 world somehow doesn't matter. It's a new thing, be open to new ideas. And that helps maybe to just stay on with it. And yes, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until you understand. It's a, it's a different thing, even if it looks partially safe. Um, if you want to start rolling out, some people might still need to do that. Um, pick somewhere where you start. There's different advice by different people. People say, do your external things like your web server, your mail server. Other things say, do your internal network. My suggestion is start where you feel safe and have control, where you can back things out if you need to, where you can handle problems quickly. And always remember, your internal things are internal, your external things the world sees. Um, once you've got it running, remember to monitor it, especially given you've dual stacked. A lot of people said, I've enabled IPv6 for two weeks, and then they didn't notice for three months that it wasn't working anymore because something broke and they didn't have monitoring. So be very careful. Um, always remember dual stack was supposed to be a long-term transition technology as well. Um, on the move to IPv6 only and maintaining two address families at the same time configuration for them 
TAS problem, whatever, all the things that go along with it has a cost. So if you can, don't be fixed. My, my suggestion is don't be fixed only these days where you can. Um, who remembers those flash talk announcements? This is one from 2006, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Dan had it in his opening slide that said BSD is dying. Well, they said or say BSD is dying. I say IPv4 will die first. <laughs> so you might as well get along and do the IPv6 thing if you haven't already. Um, for developers, and I've cut that down quite a bit from what I had like a couple of years ago. It starts to say, stop thinking the way you've been thinking for before. Um, and then make sure your code can run these only as the advice I give people these days. I'll give you an example. Make dual stack work because you still need it in that order. And do not rely on a protocol family or the other. So the best example is there's a lot of code you can handle before in V6, and then early on there's this one probe, this one socket opening, this one lookup or whatever that is only done for one address family, and if it fails, everything fails. And it's not trying the other one anymore. And I've seen this so many times, and probably fixed half of it. Um, really make sure all the way down you can run with if you really want to be four only, be six only, and so on. And you don't fail if it's not available. And the last one is, you might remember the commit message from the beginning where user space came in, libnet, get out for info, please use it. Get host by, at least in our BSD land, will never give you V6 addresses. So it's a no-go. Um, with that, I'm almost for, on the menu for the for cooking and what's next. The one I'm involved with is an IPv6 only flag. Given I've lived in an IPv6 only network basically for eight years, and I can see the future with V4 going away more and more. Um, I prototyped it after people said the IGF draft is nice, but we want implementation, so I did an implementation. It's really narrow, short, quickly done. Um, they are still arguing over it, whether it's going to happen or not. At the moment, it's hidden and not compiled by default. The other thing, someone from previous is currently on this level, they want to remove IPv6 jungle friends. So that would allow you to have IPv6 packets of up to 4 gigabytes, I think. Not that anyone would put that on the wire, but there was a use case that people had when they developed v 6 25 years ago that said we need larger packets on private protocols and want to transport them. People can't imagine it these days. On the other hand, there are private networks that might want to do so. Um, one thing that came up on the mailing list, and Sasha Sun has said he'll do, if not, we'll do it together. Um, DHCP v6 in base, and with that, also a lot of glue to get you on the router from the upstream to the downstream so you know what you advertise. And with that, probably the same thing that is on my list, renumbering is one of these things that is sold into IPv6 that basically no one's doing and using, but... Because it's broken in many parts. Yes. But both of those things have one common thing is if your addresses keep changing, you have to change your config files, you have to change the places where you change your prefixes and all these things, and we still do that because we've always done that. So the idea is, long term, is there a way forward where we can save the prefixes we learn so that my mail server, my web server, but also my RC advertise daemon, my RC con, will know where to look and just use those prefixes. So as they change, I don't have to go in and edit 15 configuration files on all my on my host just to change an address. A lot of people are living, at least in some parts of the world, on the consumer grade um, 
connections with rolling prefixes. So you will get a slash 56, for example, and if you ever reconnect our loss, whatever, you will get a new slash 56. So if you have any static addresses anywhere in your network, you'll go and find them. And you do this once, you do this twice, and then you are upset. Yeah. In Canada, we get slash 64. Yeah, but you know, he's mentioning he is German, and in Germany that's actually mandatory by law what he's describing. You cannot have stable prefixes. Well, you can if you pay for them as a business yes. customer and sign the paper. But um, at home users, yeah. uh, you can't give them stable prefixes. Yeah. yeah, you have to rotate them by law. Privacy. Don't ask me why, I'm just a messenger. The, an the answer is privacy. <laughs> And they virtual and probably accounting as in it's a revenue generating thing yeah. that you have to pay for the thing because that's what they've been doing in IP before. Um, they had planned to put an option into your web configuration thing for your account that you can say I want a static one, I accept the risk. It didn't happen. Um, the other two things is I'll start on the bottom with the working backward from NFS mount. Who is doing network booting here? Netboot? Yep, who's doing netboot over IPv6? Ah, all hands down. <laughs> so fixing this, fixing the bits of NFS mount, root, uh, root FS code, whatever it is, and then working backwards to loader and UFE. Um, we had a presentation at the Dev Summit with UFE updates for Beehive, so it'll possibly be able to do this in a VM to quickly turn around because finding real hardware that probably has all of its working at this point is tedious and it's gonna cost a lot of money. Um, the other thing I have privately started is we have the option to compile out V4 from FreeBSD since 2011. Um, to take this one step further, I'm starting to remove the IPv4 header just now and see what compiles. At the moment, not much. Um, <laughs> once I manage to get a vote through, I will tell people again. Um, the idea is there's so much third party software out again at one point, especially if you think of an in an IoT world where you might not have V4 anymore. You don't want the entire V4 graph shifting along and violating the software or whatever. You just want to say, as you did in the old days, no IPv6, you want to say no IPv4 these days. In order to fix the software, you need a platform to test this on, and there's no platform so far, so let's do this. And with that, the question was that I had in 2009 on my badge for BSD CAD. Do you remember legacy IP? Well, I have to admit, these days I have four addresses left somewhere over my entire infrastructure. And I've had this basically for eight years now. The funny thing I will tell you is, by improving IPv6, I have lately improved the IPv4 code in the kernel as well. So, yes, I do remember legacy IP, but I have trouble remembering some of the DHCP before and configuration and stuff. I have to admit, and I'll leave that to other people these days. So with that, thank you for me and questions, feature requests. Um, one reason people are nowadays suggesting to start externally is because you have uh, FBI books. So you can break things in DNS, you can break things in your web server, wherever you want. And people should not be noticing at that point. Okay, I'll repeat for the remote yep. people. Um, as Mignano said, if you want to roll out V6 and don't know where to start, people sometimes start externally because happy eyeballs, in theory, should catch the breakage on IPv6 and you can work along with the working IPv4. Yeah, but part of the problem is you don't notice that there's an issue. Yes. So we go back to money. Yes. Okay. Yes? I've got a bit of a question for you. Um, since, since I work for Paul ISP here in Canada, we, um, I have a hard time pushing IPv6 in our network, right? Especially in North America. 
over here and kind of ran out of IP before I had to watch the way to the rest of the world. Right? Uh, a lot of the a lot of the pushback is that well, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, they're never gonna drop IP or support, right? So why do we need to read it ever longer? Um, well, what would you say to that? Like being from Europe where it's, it's a lot more commonplace. Having recently moved country, uh, I don't know if you know, there are differences as well. Um, I think the trust for the IPv6 usage are growing and we can see those. It'll still take some time. It might take way longer than I would like it to take. But not doing it at this point, I think, I can't imagine anymore. Um, it's like the other example, for example, Microsoft says, we are going to do our internal corporate network IPv6 only. Well, the next question, they say, Windows Server, you can't turn this off anymore unless some of the things go start, start failing. The question really is, at what point are they going to do the reverse Win XP thing? They said, they said, okay, you have to turn V6 on manually. So they might say, you have to turn V4 on manually on those things. And by that time, the world, you know, at one point, people will wake up for one reason or the other and say, you have to. So rather do it now than later. I think it might take uh, Google or Facebook to say, we're not doing IP before anymore for that to happen. Okay, well, they, they want to do that, but Facebook has everything internally for V6. Um, and then they, they have just proxies for the other one. Yeah, I hope they, they will not do that. Because, uh, so in, internally, we have we have some V6 and we have a prefix, but to our end customers, we sell them up for V6. I it, it's a constant fight because it's a thing, it's a lot of work, and you got to pay for it in some cases to get the, the yep. support up to the end user. And no, why should we bother? So, it's a small ISP in Canada, which, been there, done that, that means you probably don't have the current support contract for the firmware updates on pretty much any gear you run unless it's not a micro tip shop. No, probably. Some you do, okay, but not necessarily some critical bits here and there in your network. At least some cost. It won't be massive, but maybe some cost. Um, one thing that I keep hearing over and over and over and over in every community across Canada is bitching about how hard it is to get a static IP address in this country. Yeah. IPv6. Oh, look, we happen to now have a, on an ISP scale, nearly infinite number of static prefixes that we can give to our customers. We can charge them maybe like half of what a business customer pays and give them static IP6 and dynamic V4. That could probably be needle right now. We had enough V4 space for for a while. Uh, like yeah, we still do. Yeah, we have one slash nineteen, two slash twenty. But um, well, maybe I have an so well, so you can. Well, you know, we, we serve a team market. Right? Maybe I have a couple of questions for you. You yeah. said you have IPv6 internally, or some might be this internally. We have a V4 prefix. The biggest challenge right now is getting okay. the money to uh, to get our like our LP packet cores compliant with V6 so that we can provide V6. Right. That's a very good idea. I think I'm happy you want to talk yeah. offline later because yeah. it's going to be the business discussion. Yeah, there's still your slash 19, you get some money. Actually, <laughs> 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 I'm not joking. I'm yeah, serious. Yeah. Actually, I'm really scared. Yeah. Uh, John Parrott has said yeah. the IPv4 transfer is legitimate. Okay, let's do that. So I have another question. Yeah, so yeah. many people are using IPv6. What's your experience at the moment? What's the hardest thing? What are you missing? Yeah. This is a little anecdotal, and it's from 2000. 15 or 2016, but I worked for a fairly, let's say, large ISP in the States. We only covered a single state, but we had like 8 slash 16, you know, whatever scale. Wow. Um, we had a third of IPv6 broken for years, and nobody cared. Um, that The world's gotten a lot better, um, but I think what we're going to end up seeing 
seeing is it's not going to be the big boys that go away. It's going to be the small guys. It's going to be the startups. It's going to be the third world. It's going to be all of these things, and it's going to slowly grow. Well, um, it seems that based on the previous slide, you have a few things to okay. Ed? Uh, what I'm missing is a small or medium sized Canadian ISP that will sell the IP set. Okay, you have one next door almost. I think Rogers supports sizing the account or the data points. That's why he has another one. Do you need anything for free YouTube? Yeah, by some sense of that. So, for, for the record, given previous discussion and this, the Canadians are still having trouble with IP. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I would need some help to just finish my uh, own network. Oh, yes. I'm available, I'm a consultant, I can give you my credits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Canadian here without a lot of experience with uh, V6. Um, if I'm running a, like a small office network with like 40 machines, um, what motivation would I have to go from V4 to V6? Um, let's say the internet point could be either in matter and I run NAT. Would, would there be like a reason why I want to ever change? Ever? Yeah. I say that right here, so I don't have any opinion. It'll be speed, accessibility. And reliability, and it's going to be a slow ramp to get there in Canada, anyway. Yeah, we'll get there eventually. So the, the other thing that hopefully will happen is at one point the lines will cross and the default will go down and the V6 will go up, and you will see a lot more people than out before. So if you will still want to talk to them, there is no not much of an option in that direction. Um, as a small business, I don't know, I've seen a lot of medium-sized businesses in the before world that still have double nuts sitting there somewhere in the middle of a company after an acquisition. Before that, in theory, should never be a problem, for example. I mean, we think that should never be a problem. Yeah. There is a problem with V6. There's no clearly defined equivalent to RC 1918. Yes. And that is a huge problem. FD0, we use FD00 addresses, and we're kind of not really supposed to be, to my well, knowledge. Well, you have to use them if you do the NTP, the one you mentioned, uh, its translation. Exactly. But only in that case. In our case. And only when the network is not supposed to be connected to the internet. In our case, it's because we have a bunch of jails, so we want to guarantee have an IPv6 address, even if they're running on a provider that doesn't give us IPv6. So we throw an FD00 address in the jail for that time, which is so, kind of, but strictly not exactly equivalent to IPv6. Depends on how you see it. So I don't own IPv6 address space. I know my IPv6 address space that I get from my provider will change randomly. So in general, I have rolled out ULA for myself. Yeah. And on the edge, where I talk to the outside world, there is public global space. So. You can. If you're a company at one point, you might just acquire a V6 space and be done with it. No, in North America, you can't oh, just okay. acquire V6 space. My parents' policy is you must be able to document two ISPs that you connect to, that do business across ISPs, before they will give you any IP address okay. space at all. A lot of companies look at that and go, well, but we don't. What do I do now? So, any last questions so, about free <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm cutting up. Good. In that case, I'll let you go. Thank you.